welcome back. This is our second of four NDSU Extension Horse Management webinars for the spring of 2022. And so we're glad you came back. Uh, we are going to get going today. We're going to be talking about geriatric horse and foal care. And so before we move there, uh, my name is Mary Kina. I'm the Livestock Environmental Management Specialist at NDSU. And I have today, our speakers are our very own team. And so today we have Paige Brumman, who is the NDSU Extension Agent in Ward County, and Rachel Wald, who's the NDSU Extension Agent in McHenry County. And so uh, Paige and Rachel today are going to be talking about geriatric horse and foal care. So I'm going to turn it over to them. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will be managing that for the afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I was able to, to get the topic of, of geriatric or senior horse care. Um, and it, it's usually something near and dear to everyone's hearts because everyone's had that special horse in their life that they want to keep around as long as possible. Um, currently, this is my husband's horse. His name is Bill. He has been my the one that I've been taking care of in that kind of senior geriatric range right now. He's 19, so he's just getting in there. But how do we define kind of a senior geriatric horse? Well, of course, by age, um, that would be that would be one way, but sometimes age is just a number, right? Because we've got those horses that are old enough that to be in that kind of age range, but don't act like they're there. Um, so another way is, is talking about, um, unfortunately, the decline of the physiological function. So when you see that horse, it's having issues with arthritis or maybe losing some of its muscle mass or, you know, becoming kind of a hard keeper. That might be one of those, those declines that we're seeing in our senior horses. Um, the other way to think of it as, is it kind of reflects on an age group or a population that you may have. So as your older horse is getting older and maybe your herd is getting younger, um, he might be the, the aged one in your group. So those, those are all things to kind of take into consideration uh, when you have that older horse, because it is important um, to consider these things as you go forward, as you're caring for these horses. And it looks like I have an accidental slide in there. Um, <laughs> so our senior horses, a lot of the senior or signs of aging that we're seeing, um, a lot of the times we're gonna see those dental issues right away because we're gonna notice them dropping feed or having some trouble getting, getting things chewed. Um, a lot of those older horses are gonna have those teeth worn down or maybe some dental issues. Maybe they're losing some teeth that they've had normally in other places. Um, also, we're going to see some, some different things that, that contribute to body condition score or, or the way they look. A lot of our hind gut loses some of that ability to ferment fiber, which is an important part of our diet for these older horses. The small intestine loses some of those functions to absorb those, those in nutrients that we're trying to get into their body. Older horses are also prone to Cushing syndrome or cancer. Um, and this is something that you want to work with your veterinarian or your local health professional or horse health professional on as well. Like I said, the loss of mobility. So if they have some arthritis, those are going to be some issues to, to address as well. And then loss of body condition score. That's going to be a, one of the major features as we talk about some of the nutrition things go, going forward here. So a lot of our older horses are going to be fed differently than our middle-aged or younger horses are. So we wanna make sure we take that into consideration as we get, get up there in age. Um, the total diet for, for an aged horse, for a senior or geriatric horse is gonna depend on their condition. But um, most of the time the hay and grain combined in a dry matter basis should contain between 12 to 16% of a high quality protein. And the reason we're talking about high quality proteins is because we talked about just a little bit ago that um, that hindgut fermentation kind of loses some ability. Also that, that small intestine loses some ability to absorb some things. So having a higher quality protein or a higher quality fiber is going to increase the ability of that horse to take in um, the proteins and that fiber to make sure that they have that healthy basis for their diet. They also lose the ability to maybe pick up some of the phosphorus and calcium that, that are normally in feeds, but maybe aren't able to absorb as easily. So having, having a little bit more of that or having 
the proper amount of that is important. Um, it looks like my my decimal point is off on the phosphorus. It's supposed to be 0.3 to 0.4 percent, and then 0.6 to 0.8 percent of calcium. We want to make sure that they have enough vitamins and minerals. Um, if it's not available in the feed source, then we want to make sure that it's it's there in a concentrate, uh, possibly fed in a feed or as free choice. So this is where I'm going to talk about kind of body condition score and how that means the differences in feeding. Um, the, the pictures here are something that I picked up from Kentucky Equine Research. And if you guys haven't been to their website, it's fantastic. They have some great information there on feeding all age ranges of animals, um, horse animals. They are the leading in the United States for, for horse nutrition. So I would highly recommend that website to just about anybody because that's where a lot of the, the experts get their information. But if you're looking at a body condition score, and that's kind of where Bill is, if you saw that first picture, he's, he's about a five and a half or six um, on body condition score. And that would be from top to bottom, five, six, seven in that picture. You do want to feed one and a half to 2% of their body weight of, in dry matter per day. That is an important amount there. So that's going to be just about every horse. You want to have a good quality grass or alfalfa mix hay. So that's going to be where our main fiber source comes from. And then typically this body condition score doesn't necessarily need uh, grain, but if you do give some grain to this, this body condition score group, you're gonna wanna restrict the starches and sugars, um, and then make sure there's a little bit more added fat. And that goes along with some of the issues um, in the hindgut. If, if there's a lot of starches and sugars, it can contribute to issues like laminitis or colic. So that's important. Um, the fat for colic, it's important to make sure that it's kind of restricted in th that area for our aged horses. Now, if you get into a body condition of less than four, so you're looking at the picture on the, on the right side of the screen here, um, the top one would be a body condition of three and the bottom one a body condition of four. We're still looking at feeding one and a half to 2% of that body matter, or body weight in dry matter per day. Now the, the difference between that five and a five to seven and the below four is we really want to look at a good to excellent quality of grass hay or fiber with that or alfalfa mixed hay. When you get into grains, because this this body condition score is going to need some grain, um, you're looking at a 12% fiber composition of that concentrate or grain that you're giving between 12 to 16% crude protein four to six percent fat um, and then make sure to feed that concentrate amount um, anywhere in between that half to one percent of the body weight and then also to minimize the sugars and starches as well. This is an important part uh, working with someone who knows nutrition. It's going to be easier for you to come up with um, maybe the concentrates that you feed these horses because it is an important part of their diet. Um, to make sure that they can either maintain or go up in a body condition score so that they're more able to continue their life into those senior stages. So as we're talking, uh, we did have a couple of questions last week of, of horses that possibly can't eat hay. Um, so we have kind of two divisions that I broke this up into, horses that can eat hay and horses that cannot eat hay. And kind of what maybe those, those areas would look like. So if your horse still can eat hay, um, you wanna use a higher fat. This is um, for, for a concentrate or an added, added concentrate to the diet. Um, so besides the hay, you're looking at a, a higher fat diet um, with possibly a, a heat processed, um, like an extruded or a pelleted feed to go along with it. You wanna make sure that there is still some fiber in that feed as well, um, but majority of their fiber should be coming from that hay. You also wanna make sure there's an adequate intake of vitamins and minerals. And sometimes you can do that with your pasture group. Um, make sure that you get a vitamin or mineral that could be free, free choice with maybe horses that are out on pasture. It'll say that kind of right on the label. Now, if you have any horses that cannot eat hay, um, you're looking at a complete feed 
that has a highly digestible fiber in it. Um, fiber is super important to keep that gut moving and going and, and working properly because it is important to, to really have that there to make sure everything gets pushed through. Otherwise you end up with issues, um, including colic in there. Some high quality sources um, that we wanna that we want to look into are, are sources of protein um, and then vitamins and minerals besides the, the fiber. If your horse can't chew well, um, you can make a slurry. So adding water to anything to soften it up to make sure that they can get some chewing in. Uh, the mastication process or the process of chewing while salivating is part of the digestive process before it goes into the stomach. Um, a lot of issues come around when the feed that's going through their intestines isn't totally broken down or digested properly prior to coming into the, the small intestine or the large intestine. So it's important to get some of that going as well. So if that means that you have to create a slurry so that it's easier for them to, to kind of chew or get some saliva going in there, that is important. Now, horses that aren't able to eat hay, you want to feed these guys at least three times a day. Um, that's important because I'm sure everybody's heard horses are continual eaters. Um, otherwise, issues like, um, sorry, the beeping's kind of, um, issues like ulcers can, can arise because they don't have food in their stomach all the time. Some good fiber sources include beet pulp, um, dehydrated alfalfa meal, and some soy hulls. Those would be some examples of extruded extruded feeds as well. So as we get into this, um, one of the questions that we had is chopped hay. So under our fiber column here, we have chopped hay. That would be one of the best sources of fiber if your horse can eat that. Um, if they're getting to the point where maybe they aren't able to eat hay as easily as, as they were before, you know, the big chunks that are longer, longer pieces, Chopping that hay is one option. Um, it can help maintain that digestive efficiency if you're able to chop the hay. It's easier on their mouth, especially if they've lost some teeth or have their teeth worn down and aren't able to chew quite as well um, because there's usually a circular motion as they chew. They're not able to do that as well. Um, getting those pieces into the half to one inch size is what we're looking for for the chopped hay. One of the things, one of the questions that we had was, how do we chop the hay on a small scale? So there's a couple of options there. You can, you can get it into a press cube um, and that's going to be in a bag form that you'll be able to find at TSC or any of your local, local feed stores. Um, another option is buying that chopped hay in a bag at a local feed store, but that gets pretty darn expensive. I did find online there are some small bale choppers, hay choppers online, but those range from anywhere to like three to $500 to over a couple thousand dollars. So that just depends on, on how you want to use it or if it's, if it works out for you. I have been able to find some of those online. Other alternative fiber sources, like I said, those hay cubes, some pellets or beet pulp are, are another option. Um, the nice thing about all three of those is you can add water to them. Um, it's another source of water to get in there to help uh, reduce the chances of impaction. So we don't want them to colic off of this because it's too dry um, and impaction could be an issue. So you want to make sure that some of these are wetted, wet down. The high quality proteins that we talk about. So when we talk about extruded proteins, that means that they're heat treated. Um, they go through an extrusion process where, where that that bean or soybean is, is what I usually go for with an extruded byproduct. So soybean meal is an extruded byproduct, which means it's heat treated as it goes through their process of, of getting the oils out. Um, steam rolled or flaked is another option. And then alfalfa meal and soybean meal are two of the higher quality ones that you really wanna look at because they have a great source of protein and then they also are high in um, amino acids, which is important for that hindgut health. 
And then lastly, I just want to kind of talk about some some overall things that we would look for in those senior geriatric courses. And one of the quotes that I came across as I was doing a little bit of research is the solid foundation of good nutrition is required to maintain our old friends, which is a very good point. You're making sure that you kind of get, get things going early on and, and have some preventative steps ahead of your horse so that you're not essentially catching up to make sure that they're, they're in that healthy body condition score. If you're still exercising your old friends, if they're in that good body condition score, even if they're not, um, and you want to make sure that they keep their mobility, maybe not having any issues with getting around. If you're still exercising them, make sure you have that proper saddle fit. Um, because as they lose the muscling on the top end of their bodies, they're more prone to having saddle sores. So making sure that saddle fit is important more comfortable for them, more comfortable for you. Make sure you have a good farrier. Um, that is a huge one because as they get older, feet problems become an issue. But if you're able to maintain their feet at a good, good place um, with a good farrier, that's going to be, that's going to keep you ahead of a lot of things. And then making sure they have yearly exams with your veterinarian. Uh, definitely checking those dentals or their teeth every year, um, sometimes every six months if needed. But if they're just getting checked once a year, you and your vet should be able to work out a plan for the next six to 12 months um, based on their dental, physical, and vaccination schedule. Also in there, in that physical kind of slot, you want to make sure that the, you guys are getting um, some regular blood work done to check organ function, and then also doing a urinalysis, so checking their urine to make sure everything's looking good there as well, because that'll tell you a lot about their liver and their kidney function as you go through. The vaccinations are important um, because our older horses are more prone to having infections. And if, they, if they're vaccinated for a lot of things, you're able to head that off in the past and pass. And then one of the things that I forgot to put on there is actually deworming, um, making sure that your deworming schedule is up to date maybe doing a yearly fecal to make sure that they don't have high loads of anything and then keeping them healthy. Because if you have intestinal parasites, the, that actually causes some issue with absorption of nutrients as well. So you want to make sure that they're clear of the, all those things. So next I'm going to pass it off to Paige. Thanks, Rachel. So I'm going to talk, we're going to switch gears here, and we're going to talk about our young horse care, those younger horses that you may have in your herd or be thinking about bringing into your herd. So the things that we want to consider that are different from your typical adult management is going to be their health program, their nutrition, and then the facility requirements as well. So we're going to uh, skip over the pregnant mare discussion and just uh, talk immediately into the, the new foal. And as, so we're going to assume that the mare had a healthy pregnancy, was maintained according to um, industry standards and veterinary recommendations, and that the delivery uh, went well and was healthy. So right there in the first few hours of the foal's life, a general rule of thumb is going to be the rule of one, two, three. That foal needs to stand within an hour, needs to nurse within two hours, and it needs to pass its first manure, known as meconium, within three hours. And that three-hour time frame is also when that mare needs to pass the placenta. Those are kind of our general, um, very basic rule of thumb for indicators of a foal starting off healthy. The next recommendation is going to be that if you have a new foal that you're expecting is that you have a well foal exam performed by your veterinarian uh, 24 hours post nursing. Uh, make sure that your veterinarian knows that you're expecting a foal, knows when its due date is, so um, that you are able to get that appointment set up um, in a timely fashion. Typically, the important thing that they're going to do, along with just checking over the, the general health and well-being of the mare and the foal, is they're going to evaluate whether uh, that foal had passive transfer of those colostral antibodies from the mare. Uh, very important that that, again, that foal nurses within two hours, um, at 12 hours post foaling, that that foal is reducing the ability to absorb those antibodies the, from the colostrum. So very important things to keep in mind. 
some signs that you might need to schedule an earlier exam for your foal, not wait for that one day or that 24 hour uh, checkup would be if it's not nursing, it, it failed, it's one, two, three rules. Um, it has any signs of abdominal pain. So if that foal is rolling, getting up and down frequently, kicking at its belly, those are urgent care needs. If they're straining to uh, defecate or urinate, you need to call your vet and any lameness as well. So let's jump into kind of the next stage of that foal's life. Uh, nutritional needs are typically going to be met through the mare's milk for those first couple of months. So again, it's very important that you are feeding that mare adequately. And, and we're not talking about the, the pregnant mare care, the lactating mare care today. Um, that could be a topic for a different time. But uh, keep that in mind that that's really essential in order to provide for that foal because they are receiving that nutrition from that mare. Um, we're also going to assume that they that that pregnant mare was vaccinated appropriately and they received antibodies and protection from disease through that colostrum. But as you see in the picture here, at about a, a week to two weeks of age, that foal is going to start feeding and eating the mare's feed as well. And that's going to help to uh, get their digestive tract uh, ready and mature and able to process those types of feed, even though their nutritional requirements are currently being met solely through the mare's milk. They're getting that immunity from the colostrum that we talked about earlier, assuming all things went well. Um, and it, it's important to note that those foals are going to be nursing multiple times an hour, over 30 some times a day. Um, they're ingesting a large amount of milk, 12 to 20% of their body weight in that milk. And they're gaining two to 3% of their body weight per day. So if you think of like a typical hundred pound or so foal, young foal, they're gaining two to three pounds a day. That's, that's a heck of a weight gain. That's really impressive. So um, all of these things kind of need to line up right to make sure that that foal is, is progressing normally. Here's where the owner needs to start to get involved a little bit to make sure that they're developing correctly. Um, and that pre-weaning stage, when the foals are, are two to six months, there's different viewpoints out there on when to wean foals, but it seems like most um, are weaned at four to seven months of age in this area and really across the nation. Um, so in that pre-weaning stage where they're just a couple of months old, um, here's some things to consider. The mare's milk isn't meeting the needs, isn't as high in nutritional value starting at about two months of age. Um, so that eight to 10 week period, that foal is going to be eating again, quite a bit of feed with the mare. They're going to be nibbling on the hay and the, and the grass and any grain concentrates that you're feeding. It's important that that foal is becoming accustomed to hard feeds so that when it gets time to wean them, they're, they're used to eating what they're going to eat post weaning. Um, so that's something to consider too. If your horses are out on pasture and you're getting ready to wean this foal, you want to make sure that that foal is accustomed to eating whatever it's going to eat. So if you're going to be pulling it into a barn or a different corral area where they're going to be eating hay, Make sure that that foal is used to eating hay while still on the mare and with the dam. So here's some guidelines from the AAEP, which is the American Association of Equine Practitioners. It's a good, really good resource for you if you're looking for specific information and details and data and numbers, um, definitely a good resource. So just some general rule of thumb, provide a high quality roughage, whether that's via a pasture or a hay, and provide that at free choice to your foal. Supplement with a balanced grain ration. Um, typically, a, a general rule of thumb, again, is about start them slow at about one pound per month of age of the foal. So if you're starting to feed them and accustomed to grain um, at two or three months of age, you'd be wanting to feed them two to three pounds a day as a general rule of thumb. And then adjust according to that, to the desired growth that you want in the foal and the body condition score of that foal. Um, many of our, our formulated foal rations that you can buy commercially out there, those grain products have really detailed feeding instructions. Um, those are balanced by a nutritionist. If you're buying uh, many of the well-known national brands of, of a foal or a growth formulated feed, um, definitely look into those amounts. Something to keep in mind is to divide these rations and these feedings into multiple small meals every day. So don't just go and feed um, all of their grain ration at one time, divide it up into as many meals as you can, you know, a minimum of two to three times per day more if you're able to. 
It's also a good idea pre weaning to use a creep feeder or separate, begin to separate that foal from the mare when you feed them their grain. So you're sure that the foal is getting the amount, especially if you have a group setting with multiple young horses um, or a mare that uh, eats quite quickly, they're probably going to consume it before the foal is able to get their required amount in them. So keep that in mind. And then if we look at this chart on the right, shows our requirements for growth and some of our key uh, nutrients in our young horses. So at six months of age, um, we, okay, so here I want to back up a step and say, oftentimes I hear people get hung up on, on protein and protein is important in young developing horses. I, I want to keep that in mind. Um, but you'll see here on this chart that it's listed in pounds and not in percentages. So oftentimes um, we see a, a 14 or 16% protein on our feeds, but we need to convert that into how many pounds they're actually receiving. Because you can feed a you know 14% protein feed, but if they're only getting a half a pound of that a day, they're not meeting their requirements. So we need to do the math to convert that appropriately. And then secondary, what we forget about is uh, protein is very important, but energy is the calories that they're getting. And that's what's providing a lot of the, the weight gain. So sometimes we forget about the energy requirements that are necessary. Um, if you're interested in getting really specific on nutritional details, there are all sorts of charts for different stages of growth in your horses um, and different levels of work. So if we're talking about young horses, this chart here, we're just talking energy, protein, calcium, and phosphorus at six months, uh, 12 months, and two years of life for those young horses. Um, there are charts like this uh, from the NSC that will provide these amounts and data that are data that is required for each individual stage, life stage of the horse. So whether you have an old horse, a young horse, um, a middle-aged horse that's being in light work or in heavy work, all of their nutritional needs are different. So let's go back to that weaning stage. Once your horse is weaned, usually around that six months of age or so, we wanna provide an even steady growth, okay? So oftentimes this is gonna require a minimum of two to 3% of body weight in that high quality forage. And again, whether that's a high quality pasture or supplemented with some high quality grains as well. Adding that commercial grain supplement in there that's formulated toward growing horses is important so that we have our balance of our minerals and our vitamins along with our energy and our protein um, and our fat. Follow those label instructions, but start slowly. So even if um, you wanna work up to six or eight pounds of commercial feed a day, uh, concentrated feed, you don't wanna start with that all at once. You wanna start in small amounts like we talked about earlier. Make sure also that you're having clean water and providing adequate exercise as well. Hey Paige, yes. I'm gonna pause you for just one second. There's a little confusion. So if you wanna go back two slides sure. on your chart, there's just a bit of confusion on how to read that chart that you have there on the right. And so sure. uh, the question is, um, so at six months we're feeding two pounds, at 24 months we're feeding greater than five pounds. Is, oh, is that how no, we're reading so this? So the age of the horse is, is the, the, that column is where I think there might be some confusion. That is the, the amount of weight that they're gaining per day. So at six months on like approximately a 470 pound foal, they're gaining approximately two pounds a day. And then in the columns to the right, that would be the requirement. So they would need 15 and a half megacals per day in energy. They need at least one and a half pounds of protein per day. 39 grams of calcium and 22 grams of, of phosphorus. Okay. So that's where, um, yeah, the confusion is the two pounds per day at the six month, that's their approximate weight gain. Um, that's gonna vary depending upon your breed, how much you're feeding them, what your goals are. Um, I oftentimes think that it's really beneficial to work with a equine nutritionist to get some of these um, things established because there really isn't a one size fits all feeding program for every single horse, because we have different goals for them. They're different breeds. They're growing at different rates. Um, it's definitely beneficial to work with somebody who can talk with you about your specific program to design something custom for you. What we're talking about here is just kind of general rules of thumb. 
Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, so then let's, uh, after we get to the weaning stage point or the weanling stage point, let's move into our yearling and our two-year-old growth here. Again, we wanna maintain that even steady growth and we'll talk about why in a second here. Um, during this time frame, some horses are gonna reach up to 90% of their full size. Some are slower maturing and aren't going to um, grow that quickly, but many of them do. You know, you can have a two-year-old that looks um, pretty mature for their age, even though horses we know continue to grow um, through their five and six-year-old year. Um, it does slow down after their two-year-old year a little bit. Uh, a moderate growth goal is typically ideal for most. There's some operations that might have a higher level of growth required, um, but a moderate growth goal is going to keep that horse at that body condition score around five. The problem with rapid growth, and that's if we were pouring the feed to them excessively, is that we can have some negative conditions pop up. So we can see limb deformities, we can see epiphysitis, contracted tendons, some osteochondrosis, um, or OCDs, some people um, refer to them. So those are issues occasionally with rapid growth. And often we see that in a horse that maybe had some stunted growth or slow growth, and then was quickly uh, poured the feed to them where they grew quite rapidly. Okay. So that's why we want to have even steady growth through our weanling um, up to two, three years of age. Slow growth is also not desired. So while we don't want to overfeed our horses and push them too fast, I also want to caution us to not say, well, I'm so worried about the horse growing too fast and having limb deformities and joint issues that I'm just going to feed them poor quality grass hay. And if they're a little ribby and they don't look very nice, that's okay because slow growth is all right. And that's that's a, a myth as well. Slow growth, um, where you have a poor body condition score, so that under four, they look unthrifty, they're more prone to disease, and then they do require some catching up later on. So we don't, we want to find the balance again, that even steady growth where we are maintaining that horse's body condition score around a five. All right, so we talked a little bit about the importance of nutrition. Let's jump into some of the other healthcare things. So here's a full vaccination chart. I know it's hard to read, um, but I do wanna direct you again to the AAEP, American Association of Equine Practitioners recommended table. And then very important that you work with your local veterinarians um, because they're gonna know uh, what your herd needs, what diseases are prevalent in your areas. And a lot of this goes back to whether that pregnant mare was vaccinated or not as well. That will affect the timing of the vaccines that your foal receives, as well as um, the type and kind, okay? So the chart here is simply our four core vaccinations as recommended from the AEP. They have uh, many, many pages of documents for alternative and optional vaccines as well. Just know that typically if your foal was from a mare that was vaccinated, around the time of weaning or pre-weaning is when you're gonna to want to booster them. So keep that in mind. A good recommendation too, is to make sure that they're boosted before weaning. So the month before you're going to wean, um, because then they'll have a higher level of immunity when you do provide that, well, when they encounter that stress level of weaning. Weaning is a stressful time. So we want them to have a high level of immunity. For full deworming recommendations, these are also different from your adult horse. And that's because young horses are more susceptible to parasite loads. So while in adult horses, oftentimes we recommend fecal egg counts and working again with your local veterinarian, which we still recommend on foals, but almost all veterinarians that I've visited with are gonna recommend a standard program for foals because they do have a higher parasite load um, and typically they're higher shedders as well. So the AEP right now recommends deworming at two to three months of age, four to six months of age, and then nine and, and 12. So that'd be four times a year. And then from a yearling to two-year-old year, the recommendation is again, around those three to four times a year. Work with your veterinarian to determine which drug classes uh, you're going to utilize and use. And then once they become adult horses, that's when um, we can sometimes back off on the deworming and use those fecal egg counts we did do a, a presentation on deworming uh, webinar, I think last year, that should still be on file as well. So a lot of great information in that presentation. The other thing I wanna comment as far as 
uh, pathogen load and parasites is to turn out your foals on the cleanest pastures you have available. Um, oftentimes we keep them confined in smaller areas and pens or lots, but if you can get them away from that pathogen load, you're going to have um, just a better overall experience, healthcare experience for your foals. So keep that environment in mind. All right, so lastly, let's talk a little bit about facility and management considerations for our young horses. Young horses should provide, be provided shelter, just like our older ones, whether that's through barns, windbreaks, trees. Um, make sure that you're providing free choice exercise daily when possible, and especially watch those younger foals for exercise fatigue. You'll see this sometimes in mares that are overly protective, um, that are maybe running their foals away or running the fence line to try to chase other horses away. Um, they can really exhaust their foals quite quickly. So if that's an issue, you might need to bring them to a smaller area, maybe separate them from the herd so that that foal isn't running to exhaustion when they're just a few days old. And then also um, let's talk about fencing. So fencing for foals is oftentimes very different than our mature horses. Um, especially when that foal is young, they're not able, they're learning what boundaries are, they're learning about fences. Oftentimes they're going to run into them or bump into them. Um, this is where it's nice to have a, a solid, secure, and very visible fence for your young foals and young, young animals. Um, I don't recommend wire fencing or particularly barbed wire fencing. You'll see some um, pretty tragic wrecks with that. If you can have some solid pipe or wood paneling, especially when they're, they're young, when they're learning what fences are, because like we said, they will bump into them. Oftentimes they lay down next to fences and scoot underneath them. People that pull a lot of horses will often have some mesh fencing to eliminate that. Um, that's a consideration. And then if none of those are options, and sometimes we hear that is that, you know, this is all I got and this is where it's going to live. If they're out in wire fencing, try to provide as much room as possible so that um, they're not getting trapped or hopefully there's less of a chance that they're gonna lay down next to that fence and, and get tangled up. Check regularly for hazards in your fence. So broken pieces, things that aren't right, um, just general fence maintenance, which is a good idea for all of our classes of horses, but young horses especially. And then beware of gaps. So while an older mature horse isn't gonna fit through a small, you know, vertical gap, maybe next to the water tank, a young foal can. And where a mature horse isn't going to slide underneath the fence if they lay down next to it, a young foal can and will, and they do. So checking those horses frequently and just keeping those things in mind that maybe you can't prevent every single hazard that's out there, but be aware of them so that you're able to mitigate as quickly as possible. When it comes to footing, uh, just like any livestock, we like to keep them out of the mud. However, um, young foals, again, more susceptible to uh, pathogens if they're uh, the infections through the navel, those sorts of things. You want to make sure they're on dry, clean bedding as they get older. Again, keeping them out of the mud for, for health reasons and then avoiding holes in your corrals and pastures. Also something to think about. And then we already mentioned the pathogen, the parasite load, moving them to clean ground, keeping them in areas that minimize that pathogen load. Also something to consider is biosecurity concerns. Um, when you have a, a foal and their immunity is starting to drop after that uh, couple of months of age and they're not yet boosted, that's a prime time um, when new diseases or new horses coming in should not be let near your foal. So keep that in mind if you have people coming over, um, try to keep any new horses that you purchase or that are maybe spending the night or boarding at your place away from that foal just for biosecurity reasons. I believe we also have some recorded webinars on biosecurity concerns too, to kind of brush up on that. So um, at this time, those are the, the main topics that we wanted to visit with you about today. Hopefully this covered some of your questions that you have. Um, I know that Rachel received some questions previously about geriatric horses, some of the other, um, questions came to me about uh, foals as well, but we'd like to turn it over uh, to you guys to ask us questions live. And so before we go there, Rachel did have a question in the chat. So Rachel, can you explain extruded a bit more? How is it good for horses? 
Yeah. So um, the reason I talked about extruded materials is because it's more um, digestible, highly digestible. And I can use uh, soybean meal as one of the, the options because that's actually something we produce in this state. So we take you know, soybeans from the field and they immediately have to go to uh, a soybean crushing plant. The soybean crushing plant is where it's going to pull out the soybean oil. And in the process, it creates a byproduct called um, soybean meal. The soybean meal is, is a great byproduct that's used not only in horses, but also in cattle as well. So it's a really nice product that is a high quality protein as well as heat treated. And the reason it has to be heat treated or extruded um, is the term that they use is because it's not able to be digested any other way. So as it's going through that soybean crushing plant and the, the oil is being taken out, it's heated up to the point where the oil can be taken out. And then the remainder of that is called soybean meal. And that's the process of extrusion. Is, is there another, um, let me know if, if that kind of is what you were looking for or if that's. Okay, so if, um, if there are questions, you're more than welcome to unmute and ask. You can also type them in the chat. Um, and so Sandra says, I was under the impression giving chopped hay was a big no. Could I just chop my hay like I do for cattle? So um, there are a couple of different ways to go through that. Um, the the reason I talked about chopped hay is if maybe your horse isn't able to chew as well, um, then having the chopped hay is, makes it easier for them um, because they're still able to chew and masticate and salivate, then helping along with getting that digestion process going. Um, you have to be careful about the size. Uh, usually if you're chopping hay for cattle, the size may be a little bit larger. Um, you don't normally see the half inch to an inch size in cattle unless you're really looking for a highly digestible product. Um, so if you're chopping hay for cattle, it may not be the same fit for horses. You have to also be careful about what maybe some types of feed you're feeding your cattle may not be able to be fed to your horse as well. Um, but it is an option because it's something personally that we have come by our house as a hay hay grinder and they grind up the hay for our cows, but it's not to, to as fine as what I would consider for the, for the horses. Um, so it's, it's more important for those horses that don't necessarily, aren't, aren't necessarily able to chew the, the long pieces of hay. And we still need to maybe get some fiber in their diet. And that's what we're looking at. So it's a small group is what I'm looking at. Can I interject to just one Absolutely. thing with um, grinding hay for cattle? Usually the whole bale goes in there and those that do it for horses will take that outer layer off that often has the, you know, a portion that's moldy and unsuitable before they grind it for horses. But ground hay is, is fed very commonly in European countries and Australia to horses. They call it chaff. Um, so chaff hay. Right. And I knew, I knew that and everything, but my husband... <laughs> This is an argument. And I, and when you said chopped hay, I was like, dang it, he's right. You can give a chopped hay. And I'm like, but I would never do that for my horses. And he's like, oh, we can give it to the horses. I'm like, no, 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 you don't do that <laughs> and stuff. So that's why it was kind of like crud. Maybe he the, is right. <laughs> well, and the other thing Sandra to consider is the storage of that hay. So sometimes when we chop hay for right. cattle too, it goes in a pile and it starts to heat a little bit. Cattle can handle that uh, much better than horses. So you'd have to make sure that the bale is for sure dry, doesn't have snow or that wet portion on it, get that off of the outside of the bale, um, chop it and then store it somewhere where it can stay dry and um, watch for heating in that pile. Right, and that's what I tried to explain to my farmer who's never had horses. And then he, I have had horses and I'm like, no, no, you can't do that, <laughs> you know? So I was just curious, that was all, thanks. Paige, I'm glad you mentioned that in kind of European and, and um, Australia because that's where I found most of those small bale hay choppers was in those regions. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know if they would be able to get over here for a good price, but um, I think you're going to be ending up spending a couple thousand dollars to get it shipped as well. Um, Irene says she has a, an old horse that falls in the small group of horses that probably need some chopped feed. Any other questions? 
of course, like I said last week too, if there are questions and um, something comes up in your mind later today as you're finishing your day, you can always send them to myself or Rachel or Paige and we'll make sure uh, if we can't answer them, we help find somebody that can. I think I just leave it with you really use that body condition score chart. Um, these are general rule of thumbs that work for most horses, but every horse is an individual. So if you have a horse that's losing weight, um, let's figure out how we can address it. And same for one that's maybe gaining too much weight. So use that body condition score chart. That's a really important indicator of your horse's health. And really nice on the, the Kentucky Equine Research website, they actually have a free downloadable body condition score chart, which is great. So if you're able to get on the computer and get one of those downloaded, that's going to be a really nice option for you. Okay, with that, we'll be back next week talking about hay and hay management uh, with Kevin Sedvik. And then again, Rachel and Paige will be on then as well. So we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.